Hi there. So welcome to this week's Master Copy. Um, so today I am having a go at uh, a painting inspired by the artist Peter Wileman. Uh, Peter Wileman, um, he's an artist I came across a couple of years ago. Um, his style has changed somewhat in recent years. He now does, um, still is a landscape painter, um, and I really like his work, but his more recent work tends to be uh, almost semi-abstract. Um, but uh, the, the reference that I'm using today is from a DVD I bought of his um, a few years back. And in it, he talks about his techniques and um, uh, goes through several, I think about four or five different paintings. So the link's down below if you're interested in having a look at that DVD. So what I decided to do today was instead of doing a, a literal copy of one of Peter's paintings, um, I thought I would, I watched uh, a couple of the demos this morning to refresh myself. And uh, then I'm now applying it to this reference photo, which is of Woodbridge uh, in Suffolk. Um, I'm sure some of you know. Um, and I took that a couple of years ago, uh, just going for a walk down by the river there. So um, it's good reference. It's got a good light and dark pattern, okay, which is what I'm interested in. Um, but I am using that reference and then applying some of the ideas in Peter Warman's paintings to that reference. So we will see how it goes. So first thing to note is you can see I'm working on a greyish toned canvas, a bit larger than my last uh, last couple. Um, so I, when I got to the studio, I actually toned that with uh, acrylic paint. So I just used a combination of colours, blues, umbers, um, till I got somewhere that was uh, almost grey, but leaning slightly towards the blue, which was what he used in his video. So I allowed that to dry, um, which didn't take too long. So great thing using acrylics for your underpainting. And I'm now... Um, establishing the lights and darks using something like a lilac or a violet colour. So one of the things that I found really useful from Peter's um, DVD is he um, he showed his palette and actually what he'd done is pre-mixed some uh, pools of colour and um, that's what I did on my palette down there. So some of it unfortunately is slightly out of shot but there was a chain of colours from Naples yellow um, up to sort of violet and then violet um, with a bit of white in. And then on the far side there, there was a white with a, a bit of blue mixed in. So one of the things I really think I'm, I was focusing on um, with uh, looking at Peter's work is his great sense of colour. Um, looking at a few of his paintings from this period um, he seems to use almost a limited palette um, and to me the main sort of um, gist i got was this strong uh, sort of purple um, purples and blues blue being the base color of the uh, canvas and then really using um, oranges and warmer colors like accents so um, say so mostly blue, purple, and then using um, oranges and yellows and reds as little accents just to bring the painting to life. So I like this. This was how he this is how he started using a almost a dry brush and blocking in the darks. OK, and one of the aspects of Peter's work, another aspect that I like is just the mark, um, his sense of mark making. So um, trying to add variety, um, letting some of those scribbles sort of show through and um, allowing for a sort of spontaneity to come in. OK, um, so I really like that. And I actually found this, <clears throat> the whole painting was quite enjoyable. I didn't have to wrestle with any of it uh, too much. So 
just goes to show um, this is in contrast to a painting I, I attempted earlier this week which I, I've I ended up abandoning um, because it wasn't going so well and sometimes that's the way it goes but again you try and learn from that um, but this one I think from the very start it was a nice uh, tonal pattern and say so if the tonal pattern works that will often help with the rest of the painting. So yeah, so blocking in here. Now, for those of you that have been uh, watching my series on composition and design, um, what I do here is I bring down some of that shadow. So um, I'm effectively uh, creating something like a circle composition here, okay? So this dark mass of cloud, which I picked up in the sort of um, the riverbank, also lends itself to creating almost like a frame. So it's um, you you can you probably saw from the thumbnail where the sun's going to be, which is almost like my focal point. Um, but we're creating a uh, a sort of lead-in line for our eye to move round. And then we've got the lighter sky in the middle there. So here I'm blocking in the detail of the boat. Now, um, as I say, I think in this composition, my sense is that the sun um, really is the star of the show. So that's what I would call the focal point. Um, but this boat acts almost like a secondary focal point. So it's not quite as stark, um, but it you'll notice it's quite small, so it adds a sense of scale, gives us a feeling of depth in the painting, because um, it's quite far away from us. Um, and at the end, I think it will be relatively dark compared to that mass of trees. So. So just allowing, getting some of those areas blocked in. There were some distant boats there, which um, they were so far away, they were really just dark, dark silhouettes of um, sort of barges we get down there. And that's like a distant tree line, again, sort of helping to frame up our main point of interest in the middle. So I say this is quite a big canvas, um, really, to be uh, using for one of these studies. Um, but uh, I think it's good to, um, you know, change the scale that you work in. Um, different scales present different problems and opportunities. Obviously, the great thing about a bigger canvas, if it does work, um, the scale can tend to act a bit like... Um, almost like a large widescreen TV. So it can almost feel more immersive to the viewer. Um, but I, I mean, I, ha I haven't found, as a plein air painter, I haven't found transiting to larger canvases as straightforward as you might assume. Um, I think it can be challenging to um, represent. So after laying in the purple darks, um, I'm slowly sort of introducing colour here. So um, this is our cooler blue, okay? It's slightly more, um, see I'm using a bit of cerulean blue there. So you could use phthalo blue or Prussian blue. So just going for that slightly greener blue. Um, and let's say the overall mood or well, the overall design of this painting is we have these dark purples, then we have our blues, and then sort of around the horizon and the sun, we start to warm up with um, more orangey, sort of salmon-like colours. And the fact that it goes in these stages and works towards the warmer colours um, I think really helps the painting process itself and having the pre-mixed colours. Uh, normally you can be so back and forth um, 
paintings can end up all over the place with color wise um, but this this seems to work really well so straight away you can see that warm so that's Naples yellow uh, perhaps warmed up with some red and that uh, goes in our horizon so the complementary colors in mind um, those oranges are basically playing against these this blue so we're using complementary colors here but remember the trick is is um, from a distance the painting should be mostly one thing and I would say the painting is mostly somewhere between blue and purple so warming up a little bit more there and uh, in the DVD uh, the watching it again this morning I, I liked what he was he mentioned um, the possibility of accidents and uh, if you know sometimes you can make mistakes oh no here, here we go we, that's really um, almost like the star of the show well that's certainly bringing our eye close and that was actually Venetian red so it must be two maybe three years ago now I um, had to go doing a master copy of the Mona Lisa uh, which I think is still on my website somewhere and I used uh, a book that gave some suggestions of the color palette and one of them was Venetian red so I still have some Venetian red around so I put some of that out and that's what I've used there so it's almost a slightly rustier red than something like cadmium red um, it's not unlike um, light red which is a color that I used to have on my palette but uh, and that really so you can see by putting a little bit of that there it's it's brought the composition to life um, but it's a case of less is more so we're not going to put that all over the painting we're just going to leave that in the area of interest and there I'm picking out the lights on some of this distant water thinking about this tonal pattern dark light dark light dark light so just layers of uh, depth um, because that's near the horizon I'm using uh, the warmish note allowing some of that purple to be picked up as well and so that warmish note echoing what's going on in the sky and now that paints by using the paint almost like a dry brush I've picked up quite a bit of pigment so the um, what I'm putting in there has become a bit darker okay this is one of these sort of sand banks so just thinking about the way that the um, almost the feeling of the water trickling down those those parts and that curves in nicely and points towards our boat as well So I say the whole painting is done, um, certainly how I did it, um, almost like dry brush in that you aren't using, um, you're not using masses of pigment, you're allowing the, the sort of scrubbing in motions that I'm making to um, allow the pigments to sort of merge and mix on the canvas itself. So here also just trying to create a sense of the separation between the tree mass and the water and a bit more work to that profile of this tree mass up there and uh, for those of you that are interested uh, you should go and have a look at Peter Warman's uh, website and you can see how his work has unfolded um, over the years and uh, certainly painting this you can sort of see I think what I really like about that is you know the fact that um, as an artist 
it can be very tempting to, once you find something that works, um, is to keep going with that. But it's really nice that he has managed to, um, his work is still unfolding, um, still retaining um, some of the, the look and the feel of these earlier paintings, but um, really pushing his sort of, um, use of colour and uh, design. And it's like there's an idea that all abstract art is to some extent figurative and all figurative art is to some extent abstract, uh, which is a nice idea. Um, if you think about it, by depicting nature on a two-dimensional surface, that is already an abstraction, a simplification. So all the marks you make, all the suggestions you make, even when you're being quite literal, you are still abstracting from nature, which is, you know, so complex and varied um, that you could never capture it. So you have to simplify. So the more you paint, the more that process of simplification um, becomes part of your thinking. Um, and that's eventually, uh, for some artists, what leads them into a more abstract style. It's simply a continuation of some of the uh, abstraction they might have learned um, at a more sort of figurative stage of their, their path. Mondrian is a good example of that. Mondrian, of course, is known for his uh, ab very abstract paintings squares of colour and sort of black and white sort of lines but uh, earlier in his life he was uh, a more sort of figurative painter so i think there was a there might have been a little jump there so um you may not have noticed i did i've introduced a little sort of zigzaggy line on the mud flat at the front there and that was just where that was one of these little um areas where the water had sort of drained through but i thought that also added a nice little um, sort of zigzag for the eye to travel along. And it's at parts like this, um, when you're getting into the detail, you have, it's good to keep in mind, um, I read this, I think this week is that when you're painting a larger canvas, you should remember that it's normally going to be viewed from about, uh, let's say, three or four feet away. So there's no point in standing with your sort of nose up against the canvas trying to get it spot on. Up uh, here, using the mile stick there. So, um, yeah, so you have to keep stepping back. So I've used the mile stick. That's uh, basically a stick with a bit of fabric. Um, wrapped on the end and traditionally used by sign writers and it gives you a nice um, something to rest your arm on when you're trying to do straight lines so as you can see this was a post with a cross on the top sticking out of the mud and I thought it added a nice almost a graphic touch to the overall composition also help maybe to create, creates an overlap, you can see, and pushes that boat back just a little bit further. That's another sort of tool to introduce depth. And there were some little rocks and little things down at the, the foot of it. Of course, mud flats or mud banks, there's lots of those sorts of um, scenes around Suffolk, um, got quite a lot of rivers and tidal rivers um, and they're great subjects especially um, at certain times of the day because when they're wet they sort of pick up the colours of the sky so if you're still not quite sure of a good theme uh, water on mud or mud banks is definitely a theme worth exploring I think. 
So one of the parts I really liked about the painting at this stage was uh, the upper clouds. So some of those marks are more the scribbly marks. I quite like that. Um, there's something in those sort of scribbles, um, a sort of spontaneity, which I, I think is, is quite characteristic of Peter Warman's work. But I, I really like that myself. I think it's nice, again, to just sort of, it, well, it adds a bit of energy. If everything is softened and blended, then it can all go a bit misty. So I think having some of these uh, sort of more aggressive marks um, adds a bit of energy to a composition. And as you can see, I applied a bit of paint there with the uh, palette knife. Palette knives are very good for sort of scraping on um, highlights onto mud or water. So just a bit of softening there. So the softening's all made easier because again, there's not tons of pigment on the canvas here. Um, with a much thicker painting approach, um, like I mentioned, Kevin McPherson, um, it would be much harder to blend, uh, although you certainly can blend with thick paint. Um, here it really, you can get very sort of nice sort of smooth transitions. Again, very fine, very sort of small um, highlight of water there, just to try and make it go back into the distance. And there I was adding a, I was warming it up so it's not just quite as straightforward as copying that purple. So just uh, warming things up a little bit on that mud bank. A few little sky holes there in the trees. Um, they're nice little touches help to give you a feeling of the light coming through the tree. So often a tree mass, you know, you're really reducing it down to a silhouette. Um, but then if you can add little breaks, um, it can help bring that to life a bit. So, but that's definitely, that's, I'll have to do something about sky holes because they don't come easily. So there we go. That's uh, our sun breaking over that uh, bank of red cloud. So I really like this. He keeps the sun nice and small. It's very easy or very tempting in a landscape painting to put a great big sun. Um, I don't know if it's a sort of romantic idea, but obviously keeping it nice and small, uh, to me, I think it creates more of a feeling of depth, distance. Um, it's a sort of case of less is more. And more sort of similar in some ways to nature. And there we are. So that's... The, uh, the highlight being picked up directly underneath the sun in the mud, which is he all helping to reinforce the sense of reflection. And they're just going a bit more intense with the yellows, creating a bit more. So that's real, this nice sort of um, orangey red around the sun. Um, that really works well against this overall bluey grey composition. And here just picking up more light on the water there, so making that. And I think I sort of nudged that water in that area just a bit more towards that goldeny orange colour. So I think to see that sort of um, sun over the water there in Woodbridge, you'd probably have to get up very early in the morning as opposed to sunset. Um, I think that's uh, looking east. 
out towards the coast. A few little posts. So again, details are like the icing on the cake with a painting like this. The big effect is created by the tonal design and the colour pattern. Um, but a few little points, again, this is our, we've got our star of the show, which is the sun, um, the sunrise. But little bits of uh, detail add for interest so that our eye can travel around the composition. Dots, little dots and dashes again. Remember, variety is what keeps the eye interested. So you want um, to vary shapes, lines and dots. They are three, three of the main ingredients in a painting. There's that little S. More little sparkles of light as that water at the bottom of the mud bank there. So I really enjoyed this. I mean, I enjoyed doing the Seago one last week. Um, I think this. Uh, I think I learned a lot from this. I think particularly the power of pre-mixing the colours, thinking a little bit about the colour palette before you start a painting. I think is a good thing to do um, and working with this again it's your painterly one color I think that's borne out in this and any excuse to use a bit of cerulean blue I think that works a treat in these paintings um, it's also quite a challenge um, it's a a good challenge is to um, to use the colour scheme or the painting style of uh, an artist that you like and then apply that to some of your own reference material. I think that's that's a really nice way of working. After you've done a few straightforward copies, actually apply what you've learned. Because we're not uh, aiming with this to um, become one of these artists um, or just carry on but we're trying to learn from each artist that we study and that's the trick to it so there's a few little dashes of light up there just adding interest to the sky And also, I mean, I'm pleased that I, I mean, it's very easy to buy these DVDs of artists to sit down and watch them and think, oh, that's good. Um, but to actually set up your easel, you know, make a few notes, go through what they're saying and actually apply some of it. Um, that's a rarer thing, I think, a bit like watching cookery programs. So I think that is, again, it's good if you're looking to learn and develop as an artist, then you should use all these resources. Um, this DVD was produced by um, Townhouse Film. I think they're the ones that um, do lots of good artist videos, but you should definitely, you know, look them up. Um, DVDs artist magazines you know there's these are all places you can learn anyway so there we go so i think that's uh about it i think i put my signature on at the end so i hope you found that useful um, if you have any questions you can always leave them in the comments below and uh, i'll try and get back to you i'll say I'll be here next week for another master copy and uh, here's the finished painting so I was really pleased with that. Anyway, remember to like the video and subscribe if you'd like to see more. And I'll see you again next week.